Miracy. The other thing that I realized fairly early on was that, oh, I can clone myself and let my videos be out there doing the work. So video gave me the opportunity to be with my family and still not be, you know, missing online. Hello, and welcome to Blowing Up, the podcast that shows entrepreneurs like you how other businesses exploded in the best possible way. I'm Linda Claire Puig, the founder and CEO of Six Figure Newsletters, and I'm here with my co-host, Ari Eni, the head of strategy for the ACES Business Acceleration Program at Mercy. Hey there, Linda. In each episode of Blowing Up, we showcase an entrepreneur whose business, yes, blew up. It experienced what seemed to be a sudden success. But as we all know, that kind of success is not random or a fluke. The company employed a specific strategy that caused its rapid rise in revenue. So today we're going to dive into that strategy so that you can learn from it and determine how you might apply elements of it to your business. In this episode, we examine how to create and leverage online video to build your brand and dramatically grow your revenue, blow up, if you will. Believe it or not, I am not a video person and even I was inspired by the ideas you'll hear. Our guest is Lou Bortone, sometimes referred to as the godfather of video, and you'll see why. Lou has been a pioneer and thought leader in the video space since the launch of YouTube in 2005. And before that, he spent 20 years as a marketing executive in the television and entertainment industries. Welcome to Lou, and now let's jump right into the conversation. Sure. Well, I came from the television business, and I had always been behind the scenes. I had no desire to be on camera. I'm camera shy. I'm introverted. It was like the last thing I wanted to do, but I realized if I'm going to tell my students and followers to get on camera and start doing video, then I have to practice what I preach. <laughs> right. I did something called Bluetube instead of YouTube. And I would just do these silly videos. I would put my dogs in them. I would put my kids in them who were really young at the time. I would dress up in costumes, anything to take the focus away from me. I was hiding <laughs> behind props and costumes. One of the videos I did, the 10 commandments of video, I dressed up as Moses with the tablets and the whole thing. And they were kind of schlocky, but they got a lot of attention. The sort of blow up moment was I went to a conference, an in-person conference, and somebody said, hey, that's the Lutube guy. And I said, oh, mm -hmm. okay, I might be onto something here because people are recognizing <laughs> me from these goofy YouTube videos. What did it look like for your business to blow up? It was fun because I was getting people that were just, you know, um, showing up to do business or clients from having seen my videos, which mm -hmm. I had heard was a thing, but I didn't really believe it until it happened. People were coming to me out of the blue and I was getting a lot of referrals. I was getting invited to speak at a lot of places. Somebody had said it to me one time, you're like the godfather of video. And I'm like, that's it. That's my favorite movie. I'm <laughs> going with that. That's going to be the brand from now on because I've been doing it for 20 years and I thought I might be able to get away with it because I'm Italian and you know my love of Italy, Linda Claire. Yeah. So. And there's the accent too. <laughs> what accent? <laughs> you have a tough guy accent. Forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> so clients were coming to you just out of the blue saying they saw your Yeah, videos. just like business was dropping on my lap, which I thought would never happen. And for me, being an introvert and not having to go out and, and pitch and do hard sells and things like that was ideal. And that's why I think Video sure. in particular is like a dream for introverts because we can stay at home in front of our computer and, and still oh do God. business around the world. Wait a minute. Wait it's a funny. minute. You're blowing I my mind I would think about here. it the other way around. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think it's the perfect medium for introverts because we don't have to necessarily be in a room with 100 people, which mm. could be overwhelming. We can talk to mm. our little webcam and, and still speak to the world. Okay, so camera shy is different than introversion. That's the main clarification that you're making here. Yes. Which I think is an important one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. If you're an introvert, you may always be an introvert. And for me, that just means my people time is limited. Camera shy yeah. is like, oh my God, I hate the way I look on camera and I don't want right. to do this. Right. <laughs> right. And camera shy is curable. Got it. <laughs> Theoretically, yeah. Yeah. 
Although I've been told I have a face for radio, so I don't know if I should just <laughs> stick with audio up, but it's too late now. I'm already it's too out late. there. Okay, so there's video and then there's YouTube. And I know obviously right. the two go hand in glove, but talk a little bit about your YouTube experience. You know, back when I was in cable and TV, there were, you know, 20 cable networks and four TV networks. And now if you have a webcam and a computer or a laptop, you can be your own TV station and your own network because you have YouTube and the ability right. to reach anyone, anywhere, anytime. So that's really empowering, I think. I mean, it's a search engine. It's a place for discoverability. It's a place where you can put your content and store it for free. I mean, all this is like, oh my God, YouTube's free. So when the videos started taking off, the other thing that I realized fairly early on was that, oh, I can clone myself and let my videos be out there doing the work. When my kids were young, they were very involved in sports. And I went to a lot of soccer games and a lot of baseball games. But my videos were sort of like, oh, that's okay. I scheduled a video to go out at two o'clock. Mm -hmm. So when you say scheduled a video to go out, what does that mean? On YouTube, you can schedule a video to be released at a certain time. Or I'd put a video on Facebook that morning before I left for mm. baseball. Because it was really, at the time in my kids' lives, it was all-consuming. And I didn't want to miss yeah. it. So video gave me yeah. the opportunity to be with my family and still not be you know, missing online. You know, there's the visual aspect of video, right? Mm -hmm. And the technology to make that happen. That's one part of it. But then there's this other part that's about the content, what you say and do right. in that video. Yeah. I mean, the content is always, you know, I can't remember who said it, if it was Bill Gates or somebody who said content is king, but that's always been the case. And yeah. a lot of times, especially when I'm working with clients, I try to get them to say like, you know, look past the technology. That's not really the important part. It's the content and the message. Mm. And that's what folks want to see. They'll deal with the video if it's got a few glitches, if it's information that they're looking for and they want to see. So for right. me, the content was really about listen to my audience and figure out what they want and, and give them what they want. <laughs> not mm -hmm. necessarily what you want, what you think they want, but what they actually want. Do you also have an email list? Oh, absolutely. And to be honest, email is first and foremost my mm -hmm. go-to. There's no better direct connection than uh, having an email following that you can communicate mm -hmm. with. So, but in, having said that, you can combine the two and do video email, which is amazingly powerful. Do you put something in the subject line that indicates that it's a video? Yeah, I just say, you know, like video in brackets and then whatever the mm -hmm. video is. Somebody uh, smarter than me said that the play button is the most compelling call to action on the internet. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah, I, I could buy that. So help me understand what would be a good reason to select video over any other kind of content? Well, part of it is just that that's the way that a lot of audiences want to consume now. I mean, we're a culture raised on television and we're just so used to watching. I think it was HubSpot that said um, people will remember 90% of what they put out on video versus just 10% in print. The other good thing about it is that you can take content that you already have and repurpose it into video. So a blog post can be a video, mm. or an article can be a video, or even an infographic can be a video. So I like it because it's easy to take your existing IP and, and then just basically transfer it to video. Who should not do video? I have found very few examples and very few niches where it won't work. But how about individuals? Like if somebody wants to script everything that they do and, and comes across mm -hmm. as very scripted. I work with a lot of clients one-on-one -on -one, and every once in a while, I'll come up with somebody who says, you know what, you should do a PowerPoint video. That might be more appropriate. That might be your video sweet spot. I try to tell people not to script it because if they've never done video before and they have a script, they'll read the script and it will look like they're mm -hmm. reading the script and it doesn't feel mm -hmm. real and authentic. I've got three points on a sticky note that's stuck next to my webcam. And I'd rather do it that way than have mm -hmm. a full script. So for the solopreneurs, entrepreneurs out there who want to start using videos, what are the tools that they need? It's really very little because basically you could get away with using a smartphone with a camera. I tend to do most of my stuff on a webcam on my desktop with Zoom. And I use Zoom to record my videos. I use Zoom for meetings. 
the nice thing about Zoom is they'll give you an audio and a video track that you can then edit or do whatever you want with. The other thing is I may go live to YouTube, Facebook, or LinkedIn, and then I've got the recording and I can repurpose that or clean it up if I decide to edit it. And the other thing I tell folks who are just starting out is you can do a Facebook Live to only you and have that setting be private. So if you don't like it, you don't have to release it. And if you do like it, you change the setting to public. It takes some of the pressure off. If you have a webcam and a USB microphone and decent lighting, which is really important. So I have two big LED lights up here, then you're good to go. How do people know what is good enough? Because I could see situations Mm. where people are recording themselves and they're like, nope, not good enough. Record again. Mm -hmm. Not good enough. When, you know, the first take was perfectly fine. Yeah. I think it comes with experience. Somebody recently said, like, I did 99 takes. I'm like, well, you probably should have stopped at seven or eight (laughs) because you're probably not going to get any better after that. Also, I make a distinction between quick videos and keeper videos. So a quick video Mm -hmm. is a live video, a quick tip. Maybe you're on site giving somebody a testimonial. And a keeper video is like, okay, this is my homepage video. This is my first impression Mm -hmm. video. I need to spend a little bit more time on it. It represents my brand. That's the one where I might do, you know, nine or 10 takes because I want to make sure that it's a keeper video. It's got a lot of shelf life and I want to get it right. Good point. And I guess people should start then with those shorter throwaway videos just to practice. The best thing to do if you're starting is just to do a short tip series on your area of expertise and put them up Mm. on YouTube and get some practice and, and realize that it may not be perfect, but if you're sharing good content, people may still find it and watch it and um, you'll only improve from there. Somebody that I know talked about how he finally got used to and comfortable with doing video and, and he did that by just turning his camera on for like two hours and just talking, talking about his work and giving tips, whatever came to mind, just talking. Mm-hmm. And he said after a few of those sessions, like really mega long sessions, he really got comfortable and it was not a problem after that. Yeah, that's a great idea. That was valuable. Yeah. So when people start putting their videos up on YouTube, what can they expect as far as results? I'm guessing they're not going to get thousands or millions of views Mm -hmm. overnight, but like what, what can they expect when they just start this process? Yeah. Initially crickets, probably. <laughs> just, <laughs> so you have to expect- So that's it's, normal. <laughs> it's going to yeah. take time. It may take some videos for things to hit. But I remember one time my kids came home from high school and like, hey, dad, our class watched your video today. I'm like, I don't know why, but they loved it. I'm like, well, that does me no good at all because you know, <laughs> 16 year olds are not like the audience. Wrong target audience. <laughs> so I'd rather have 10 views of ideal clients than- yeah. 100,000 views of people that you know don't do me much good. So uh-huh. mm-hmm. obviously YouTube wants views and they want you to stay in the channel and their whole thing is about keeping you on the platform. But um, it's really more a matter of find your audience and make sure they are seeing the video. This is a long-term marketing strategy that you have to commit to like anything else. How robust is video in LinkedIn? LinkedIn is kind of a sleeping giant when it comes to video. And I don't think mm-hmm. as many people are using it as they could or should, but I'm trying Mm -hmm. to do a lot more LinkedIn lives because Mm -hmm. again, it's about stopping the scroll. If you see something that's interesting in motion and visual versus just another photo or text. So I think it, you know, they haven't quite found the footing yet, but I think it's really kind of a sleeping giant when it comes to video. Where have you seen people really get stuck as they're attempting to jump into video? Well, there's two things I think. And the first one is that they just simply don't get started. Right. And then the other thing is giving up too soon or doing two or three videos and saying, oh my God, those sucked and nobody watched them. And then just calling it a day. You really have to give it a little bit of time, consistency and build it up over time. What would you say? Like give it three months, give it six months, give it 40 videos. Yeah. Do 10, 20, 30 videos. When I do these video challenges of Facebook Live a day, at the end of the month, they've got 30 videos. And now it's like, oh, well, this is just like, all I got to do is turn on my iPhone and talk. So they realize that it does get easier the more you do. So three months, at least once a week, and don't stop before you finish that three months. Yeah, I think that's a really good goal to shoot for. That's only 12 videos. And you could record them three or four at a time. So it's kind of like, all right, I only have to do three or four video sessions and I'm going to have my Mm -hmm. three months worth of content. 
done. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming you're talking about, you know, the kind of quick tip video. So those would be Mm -hmm. what, two minutes per video, five minutes per video? It could even be shorter because now with TikTok and Reels and everything being 60 seconds or two minutes or under, you know, you want to keep those short. Although the irony is that YouTube wants watch time so that you, mm. If you sprinkle mm. a few 10, 15 minute videos in there for YouTube, then that's going to help you as well. So it's kind of a combination of I'll do my quick hits and then I'll do my mini webinar or, or my mini series that's going to be 10, 15 minutes. And that's going to be ideal for YouTube, which I never thought I'd say. But these days, um, YouTube's really kind of leaning towards that eight to 10 minute sweet spot for videos. So you would recommend if you're going to do a video strategy to always look at your analytics? Yeah, and YouTube gives you a lot of very rich analytics in terms of mm-hmm. audience and engagement and watch time. So you definitely want to look at your watch time and you want to see how's the engagement doing, are people responding to this video, how are the views in the first 48 hours, which YouTube tends to count the most. The other thing that I only recently learned is that you could go back to an old video and give it a new thumbnail and YouTube mm-hmm. will see it as a new video and give it another chance to. Mm, that's good. That, I'm starting to go back to some of my older videos and say, can I do a better thumbnail for this that might get more attention? If you're using YouTube for building your email audience, are you putting an offer to your freebie on every mm-hmm. video or just some? Or Yeah, absolutely. I would do a call to action on every video for the mm-hmm. freebie or whatever it may be. Something I learned more recently was you don't necessarily have to wait till the end because you may not have as many views at the end as you do right. in, in the middle. Right, right. So you might pop in, oh, by the way, I've got this freebie at loopwarton.com forward slash 99, where you can get 99 video ideas and it's on the text as well. So, Mm -hmm. and then you can put that link in the description of the video. I want every one of my videos to be building my email list. So I'm going to do that Mm -hmm. call to action in probably 90% of my videos. Great. Great. If it's live where I'm interviewing someone, that's kind of a different animal. Or if it's a webinar, that's a little bit different as well. But for most videos, I want to lead people to a lead magnet so I can get them on my list and have that email relationship with them and not just depend on the video. So let's talk. Lou is so funny. (laughs) It sounds like he was really ahead of his time when he was using props and costumes in his videos. But it's important to note that you don't have to use props or costumes in your own videos. Just be yourself. So a big thanks again to Lou. And be sure to get Lou's free download for you, his video planner. It's a simple, two-part resource to help make sure that you get maximum ROI on any and all videos that you create. You can grab it for free at blowingup.rocks forward slash Lou. That's blowingup.rocks forward slash Lou, L-O-U. This episode of Blowing Up was produced by Linda Claire Puig. Cynthia Lamb is our managing producer and Danny Eni, our executive producer. Post-production by Post Office Sound. To make sure you catch all the really great episodes of Blowing Up, follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. And if you like the show, we'd love it if you could leave us a starred review or share the show with a friend. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. Mm